access it to, um, on YouTube. But I want to believe I've answered your question, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Adisa. I want to believe I've answered your question. So, all companies starting applicably from 1st January 2019, you have been using IFRS 16. So the assumption is that the very minimum, you have used IFRS 16 for about 19 months. So we should all become be experts already in IFRS 16. Uh, but that's an assumption. So let us start with some little... Uh, so we'll start off with some little overview and we'll go to identifying leases. Um, remember that IFRS 16 is taking over from IAS 17. And remember we had some IFRICs and six. When I say IFRICs, they are interpretations for existing standards. So effectively, all of the IFRICs, IFRS interpretations that was applicable to IAS 17 and leases before, they all died for IFRS 16 to leave effective 1st January 2019. So when we talk leases, we expect you to just know IFRS 16. All the other things you knew on IAS 17, they are dead. So let us talk about the new thing now um, that we are expected to know. So let's go straight in. What is a lease? What is a lease? That's the first question. So a lease is very simple. As far as you actually get the use of an asset, right of use of an asset by paying periodic payments, it is a lease. For example, I go to a shop and I say, I want to have the right of use of this car for the next two years, and I'll be paying a rental every month. It is a lease. As far as you get the right of use of an asset by paying a particular rental, it is a lease. It doesn't matter the name they put on the agreement. Now, under IFRS, we use a concept that we call substance over form. Stop that substance over form. The meaning of that is that no matter what, no matter what, even if the name on the agreement is not saying it's a lease, it's still a lease. So what makes it a lease is not the name on the agreement is whether by, as a result of the substance of the transaction, it is a lease. And what is the substance of the transaction for in the case of a lease? The substance must be that you are paying a particular rental for the right of use of an asset. Then it becomes a lease. So we have been able to define what a lease is. Let's go straight in and now ask ourselves, after defining a lease, what are those things that looks like a lease that IFRS 16 does not cover. Now, the reason why they are not covered is not because they don't look like a lease, but it is sometimes because there's a separate standard that covers that. For example, all the leases for mineral resources, oil and gas, is not covered by IFRS 16. It's covered by the standard on oil and gas exploration and evaluation. Not because they are not leases, but the standard is covered by that, all those kind of transactions. Or for example, lease of biological assets. You lease the land, you lease cows. It's not covered under IFRS 16. It's covered under IAS 41 because it is scoped out. So there are some things that are scoped out, not because they don't look like a lease, but because there's a separate standard already established for them. That is why they are spoken out. So how do I know it's a lease? IFRS 16 provides for us. Please, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. I think somebody has a question already. Um, so. Okay, so. Um, okay, I think I, I, I got that. So. How do I identify a lease? How do I know it's a lease or not a lease? 
There are two major things in the standard. The standard asks us to look at two major things. Number one, do I have the right of use or do I have the right to obtain substantially all the economic benefits from the use of the asset? One, remember the first uh, uh, scope. One, do I have the right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefit from the use of the asset? Two, do I have the right to direct the use of the asset? If those two things are in place within a particular contract, then it is a lease. Let us print an example. I walk into a car shop and I told them, I want to use, I want to buy, or I want to lease a car for the next two years and I will be paying a lease rental. Now, the first thing is for us to be able to say is a lease. I must already have been able to test it on these two parameters. What's the first parameter? Do I have the right to obtain substantially all the economic benefits from the asset? So the question is, what are the economic benefits of buying a car? The economic benefit of buying a car could be that I want to enjoy it by driving it from our home to the office. As a result of that, it will help me not to pay for transport fares. The economic benefit could be that, no, I want to use it to do business. I want to be doing uh, what you call it, transportation business. That's another economic benefit. If I have the right, substantially, to collect the economic benefit, which is either the money that is coming from the business or the benefit of sitting in the car and relaxing and not paying for transport fees, then I have the right, substantially, to collect all. If I have the right substantially to collect all, but look at another example. If it were that you don't have the right to collect all the substantial economic benefits. For example, you rented Uber car. For Uber, do you have the right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefits? No, you only have the right to obtain the substantial economic benefit for, uh, or for economic, uh, get economic benefit for only that time, or to get benefit for only that time when you sit inside the car. The real economic benefit on the car is going to the person that owns the car. So for that Uber car, you cannot recognize it as a lease. The second parameter that you need to look out for is, do I have the right to direct the use of the asset? For example, as I said before, I walked into a car shop. I said I wanted to buy a car. Does it qualify for a, 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 the uh, for a, to classify it as a lease? It will qual um, qualify also if I have the right to direct the use of the asset after collecting the car from them. That means after that day when I leased the asset, I could determine to say that this car I will use it to go to the office or this car. I will use it to travel to Ibadan. If I have the right to direct the use of the asset, if that condition is there, on these two conditions, the right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefit from the use of the asset, and also the right to direct the use of the identified asset. If these two things are in place, then I will say that it qualifies as a lease under IFRS. 16. Any questions? Now I would like to entertain any questions. Do you understand how to identify? Because you are going to identify in this part. Do you understand how to solve? I want people to just say that yes or no with a chat or, or with raising of their hand. Um, yes, we understand, but you can also do a rerun, sir. Okay, so we will actually do more examples because we are actually going to go into examples now and you would identify for us. Now, so I go on. Before I begin to identify, because I'll give us case studies now, we'll go to case studies so that you understand better. But the question is now, when do I need to identify whether it's a lease or not a lease? When? I am required to identify 
if it contains a lease or is a lease at the inception of a contract, that means that whenever we have a contract in the office, you must review to determine if there's a lease inside the contract at inception. Whether the name of the contract is called a lease contract or not. So it is not the name of the contract that determines whether it contains a lease. It is the substance of the transaction. And what do you need to do? At the inception of a contract, you must review to determine if it contains a lease. Two, if there is a change in the terms and condition of a contract, you also need to review to determine if lease is inside that contract. So at two points, you must ensure that you review if a contract contains lease. One, at the inception of the contract. Two, whenever there's a change in the terms, the conditions, and the scope of a contract. And the assumption is that whenever you have a contract that contains a lease, you must separate, if it is expedient, separate the lease contract from the non-lease contract. For example, if I had gone to the shop I have been talking about, uh, I want to believe you can still see my screen. Uh, can we all still see my screen, please? I think somebody sent a chat. Okay, somebody said well yes. understood. Okay, so can you still see my screen? Can you see the slide? Yes. Okay. So, if I had gone into the shop and I went to say, oh, the contract I want is that I want to get the car and I'll be back in the slide now. again. However, uh, Eliza, Day, you would also be the company that will be servicing my car. Now, if I may ask, and I want us to answer the question, how many contracts do I have inside what I just explained to you? Did you get my question, please? Call me again, sir. Okay. I said, if I had gone into a lizard and said, I want to be able to be paying renter for this car that I am leasing, in addition to using the asset, Eliza, you will be repairing and maintaining the car for me. I want to ask a question. That agreement that I just talked about, is the only lease that is there? No. No. So what is there apart from the lease? Because the lease idea is going to be servicing the assets for you, which is not uh, right. Oh, wonderful. So that means that in the agreement, I have a lease and I also have a contract that is more than the lease. Now, I want us to now go into this. Um, so can we all still see my um, the slide? Because I want to use no, it. No, no, the, the slide is gone. You can't oh. see it. Okay, no problem. Um, Okay, can you see my screen now? Can you see no, the slide? This, this slide is not showing. No, I can't say it. Can you see my screen, the slide? Yes, we can see it now. Okay. We can see it now. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to just... Um, 
So this is the case study to determine whether we got what I'm saying or not. So we are going to do this case study together. So I want you to listen to this. You can read it too, but I want, you to, I want us to do it together. So a contract between a customer and a freight carrier provides customer with the use of 10 rail cars of a specific or uh, of a particular specification owned by carrier for five years. So a contract between a customer and a freight carrier. The contract specifies the type of car. The customer determines when, where, and which goods are to be transported using the car. When the cars are not in use, they are kept at the customer's premises. Customer can use the car for another purpose, e.g. storage, if he chooses. If a particular car needs to be serviced or repaired, carrier is required to substitute an equivalent car for the same type. Otherwise, and other than on default by the customer, carrier cannot retrieve the cars during the five-year period. The contract also requires the carrier to provide an engine and a driver when requested by the customer and stipulates that if the carrier is unable to do so, customer has the right to hire an engine and a driver from the supplier. Carrier keeps the engine at its premises and provides instruction to the driver detailing customer's request to transport goods. Carrier can choose to use any of the engines to fulfill each of the customer's requests. And one engine can be used to transport not only the customer's goods, but also other goods. I want to explain this before I say we should look at outside. So this contract is between a customer and a freight carrier. And this is for the lease of 10 rail cars for five years. However, within this contract, customer, when he collects the freight cars, remember in a car, you have engine, you have everything. When he collects the cars, the customer can decide to say, I will use it to do anything I want to. If I like, I keep the car in my house, I'm not using it. If I like, I will use it. In addition to that, he can decide to use it to do everything he wants to. And in a situation where the car is not functioning well, the carrier will provide another car while it is not functioning well. In addition to that, within the contract, if the customer needs a driver, he can ask the carrier that provided the car that do you have a driver. If he doesn't have a driver, the customer can go and employ another driver. Or if there's a problem with the engine of the car that he rented, he can ask the carrier, please provide another engine for me. If he doesn't provide it, also the customer can go and rent another engine inside the car. So the question now is that, does the contract contain a lease agreement? Remember the two things that you need to uh, uh, check. Number one, the right to obtain substantially all the economic benefits from the asset. Two, the right to direct the use of the asset. Those are the two things that you are checking for. The question now is that from this question, do we have the right to direct the use of the asset and to get substantially all the economic benefits from the use of the car? Does it contain it? It's time for you to answer. Also. Anybody can fire. What? Does it contain any? Please, you can go ahead and talk. For me, I can say based on the two important uh, factors that we need to uh, consider, which is the, the economic benefits of the 
asset and then the direct use of the asset. So if we, if we look at the scenario very well, I think there is a slight breach there, which stated that the, uh, the customer can still request for maybe engine from the carrier. Though, if that is express, expressly stated in the terms and condition, we can still assume or say that, uh, yes, it is right, it is still a, a lease agreement. But if it is not expressly stated in the terms and condition, we can say there is a breach there because according to the two uh, the factors that, is, that makes in a lease uh, consider is the economic uh, benefits used and then the direct uh, use of that asset. So anything that is uh, contrary to those two factors, I think you can see it's not a lease agreement. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other contribution, please? Any other contribution, please? It's a very interactive class, so we need to talk. The question is, does it contain a lease? Uh, I think I should be calling him now. Uh, Mr. Collins, you can answer now. I am um, okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, I just joined and I was still trying to go to the <laughs> question, but I can see add a few okay. points. For more time, I can say, yeah, it contains a lease, and but it's more of like an operating lease because in this case, the carrier has. And um, still has responsibilities um, to its customers, you know. And because I can see here, it says the carrier has to like replace if the engine is bad or and mm -hmm. um, do some repairs. It also like operates, gives instructions to the drivers on how to, you know, use or maintain the car or the, the car rails. So I feel like um, not all the uh, responsibilities, the customers don't have the full responsibilities of of the car of those car rails yet so i feel like it's more of an operating lease in that thing that's going on here i, I don't know i hope to get the correct answer okay thank you very much but i need to i need to just say something immediately now under ifrs 16 from the perspective of the lessee there's no there's no distinction between operating lease and finance lease Please, Mr. Collins, did you get what I just said? Okay, okay, yeah. It is IFRS 16 that says there's operating. No, we have not gotten there. When we keep going on, you would understand. Under IFRS 16, there's no operating this, there's no finance this from the business perspective. It's one treatment. So we will get there. Okay. But thank you very much. We will, thank you very much for the answer. Great answer. But I need more, more people, please. Mr. Isaiah, um, Oluwa Tobi, uh, Ola Tunji, Samuel, please, Mr. Shuaib, please, contribution. Okay, so if there's no contribution additional, Hello. okay, please, you can go ahead. Can you hear me, please? Yes, 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 go ahead, please. Okay, I'm not joining actually, but um, I'm actually going through the slide. Uh, my own understanding is that uh, according to IFRS 16, there is no distinction between uh, operating lease and finance lease compared to what you used to have before in IAS. So um, I think there's a lease agreement here because uh, there's a right of usage of the of the of the asset here. So, so I think uh, there's a lease agreement here. Wonderful. Okay, so let us go to the question and do it together. Now, if you look at this agreement very well, there are two different things that we, are, that we have a contract for. Number one, there is a lease of the cars. Now, if you look at it very well, the first line says that the five years is for the lease of the 10 real cars. And if you look at it very well, there are two things we need to consider. Number one, do you have the right to substantially collect the economic benefit on the asset? One. Two, do we control or direct the use of the asset? If 
those two things are there, we have a lease. Now let's look at that car. Number the second um what do you call it? The second theme here, uh, second line. It says customer determines when, where, and which goods to transport, meaning that he can direct it. In addition, when the car are not in use, they are kept in customer's premises. He directs it, and he can also determine to use it to do any economic benefit. With that line too, it shows that there's a lease of the car. So that one, done. However, within those five years, if you look at the fourth line, the fourth line is a separate, is a separate contract within the contract. If you look at it, it was talking about engine and driver. So engine and driver is different from the car. For example, the last one here, do the driver, let us assume that they give us a driver. The carrier provides a driver. Can we control or direct the driver? Because from what they said here, they only give you the driver when you need the driver. You cannot control the life of the driver. So you cannot say you are leasing the driver. In addition to that, the engine that they are borrowing you in, in paragraph four, it resides in the court. The engine they are borrowing you is like um, between the time they repair your own car. So they will put another engine inside. That engine that they are putting inside, when your car is repaired, they will remove it back home. So if you look at it, it is like you have two contracts within the contract. The first one is the lease of the car. The second one is a service agreement for a driver and also for using an engine. Do you understand my explanation? Please, I just need a yes or a no. Yes. yes. Okay, wonderful. So we have done the first case study. Let us go to the second case study. At this point, I don't think I need to explain too much. Now, this is this, uh, okay, I think I'm on three already. Uh, let us look at two, case study two. It says, a contract between customer and carrier requires the carrier to transport a specified quantity of goods. It requires the carrier to transport a specified number of goods in accordance with a stated timetable for a period of five years. The timetable and quantity of the goods specified is equivalent to customer having the use of 10 rails for five years. Carrier provides the rail cars, driver, engine as part of the contract. The contract states the nature, quantity of goods to be transported, but does not include specific details about the cars or the engine to be used. Carrier has a large pool of similar cars that, that can be used to transport the customer's goods. Similarly, carrier can choose to use any one of these number of engines to fulfill each of the customer's requests. And one engine could be used to transport not only the customer's goods, but also the goods of other customers. The cars and the engine are stored in the carrier's premises when they are not in use. Is there a lease agreement? Is there a lease inside this contract? Yes, there's a lease. What is the lease? A lease of what? Okay, good. Because if you look at number one line, line if you look at the line two, the line two stated that the carrier provides the rail car driver and engine as part of the contracts. So it means that, and again, if you look at, um, uh, it said the contract stated the nature and quantity of goods to be transported. So it stated there that the, in this type of contract, it is uh, rightly expressly stated in the terms and condition of that uh, lease because the carrier has the, uh, the, uh, the carrier has the right to, as it is now, to direct the uh, this lease agreement. The, the way I'm seeing it. Okay. So Bukola, you, you can say you can talk now, please. You raise your hand. Okay. Uh, I don't think it's a lease. It's just like a service agreement because. If the car is going to stay with the carrier, 
that means that the um, the company, that's the customer, does not have um, access to the benefits of the car. So it's not a lease. Okay, so I can see other people raising their hands. Uh, uh, please, uh, you can fire. Isaiah, you can fire, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, good morning, all the class. Good morning. Yeah, um, from what I'm seeing from the line two, it shows that there is a, is a actually a service um, rendered. Um, that's what I'm saying because of the contracts, the vehicles, and um, based on the contracts, means that it has to stay in the uh, carrier's um, premises, showing that it has a um, 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 kind of um, entitlement to every form of service and there's just an agreement of carriage of a specified goods of which the customer doesn't have um, any rights to go outside the specified um, um, goods he, he or she wants to so for me i feel this is just a service um, as far as the customer cannot control mm. and that's what i feel okay thank you remember there are two things we need to check there are two things on the checklist now i'm going to ask you the first one is that you must have the right to substantially get the economic benefit from the use of the car. The question is that do they have the right to substantially get the economic benefit from the use of the car? That's the first one, Mr. Isaiah and Number two, the second one is that you must have the right to direct the use of the car. Now, if you look at what they said, they said that line two, let me read it to you again. Mr. Isaiah, after this, you will talk. He said, Car carrier okay. provides that the rail cars, drivers, engines, at, 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 the contract nature states that the nature and quality of the goods to be transported, but does not include the specific details about the car. Meaning that the carrier can decide to use car A kind of or car B. That means we have plenty of cars in that. You are not controlling any particular car as the customer. I can even decide to use uh, Keke Marua to carry it for you. Okay, good, yeah. So to an extent, you don't have the lead of any car because it doesn't meet those two parameters. And Mr. Isaiah, you raise your hand, you can talk. No, I, I just finished speaking. Oh, okay, no problem. Okay, so yes, I'll... there is no, inside this one, there is no lease contract. Please, it's yeah. those two parameters. One, do we have the right to get substantially the economic benefit? Two, do we have the right to direct or control the assets. In this one, they don't have the right to control the assets. And since those two param parameters are not met, there's no lease. It's only a service agreement. So I think we can go to the third one. And after this third one, I think we'll go to, we'll move on with the slide. Customer enters into a 15 year contract for the right to use three specified physically distinct dark fibers with a larger cable connecting Nigeria to Togo for 35,000, uh, 35 million per annum. Customer makes all the decisions about the use of the fiber by connecting each end of the fiber to its electronic equipment. If the fiber are damaged, customer is responsible for the repairs and maintenance. If the customer had gotten another vendor for the repairs and maintenance, the customer would have been paying 10 million naira per annum for this standalone package. Now, there are two questions here. Does this contain a, a, a lease? If it contains a lease, is the only lease that is inside or more than one contract? And the third one is that, how do I break it between the lease and the non-lease? Now, I have a lot of people that have raised their hands. So let us start with, um, book, uh, I think, who has raised their hand now? So, a comfort. You have raised your hand, so please, fire. Okay, so this particular one, um, it contains two distinct contracts and they are quite different and explicit. So the very first one about the 15 year contract for the right to use the, the distinct dark fibers is a lease in the, in the sense that this person can substantially obtain the economic benefits of the use of the asset and they can control the use. They can direct the use of the asset actually because we say customer, like two says, customer makes all of the decisions 
about the use of the fibers by connecting by connecting each of the fibers, each end of the, fiber, of the fibers to its electronic equipment. So coming to line three and four, if there is any damage and repairs, the supplier will take responsibility for it. But if, okay, the supplier will take responsibility for the repairs and maintenance. Okay, so if the customer had gotten another vendor for the repairs, so I think even the, 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 the repairs and maintenance is still part of the lease agreement because they have not said that there will be another, another condition attached to the repairs and maintenance. So the two contracts are within and they, are, um, they, are, they, they qualify for as a lease. Okay, so please, I want contribution. Is it only this contract? And if it's the, is it only this contract or this contract and something else? Or is only this contract? Please, contribution. Please, you can talk. And let's, uh, Bukola, Collins, uh, Ola Twini, Samuel, there are many people here, please. Fire. But, but I think that the, the customer just has options. So you can decide to be doing the repairs by themselves or they allow the, the supplier to do Yes, so they can yes. go for the standalone package. Oh. Okay. 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 Well, that's good. I, I will see you soon. Uh, Miss Olatunji, you can fire, please. You raise your hand, Miss Olatunji. Okay. Uh, yeah. there, are, there are two contracts here. Okay. So which one and which one? One is the, the use of the fiber. And the second one is service agreement. Okay. It's, uh, 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 repair and service agreement. That's the second, uh, if you like to use the fiber, is how to use it. And Thank you very much. I want to, I, however, I, I want um, any other person, I think I have two different opinions now. Do I need another? I, let us know there must be a winner. Yeah, this contract. Huh? Hello. Uh, yeah, please, this uh, contract. Is, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Hello. We yes. Can hear you. There is a lease agreement and a service agreement in this contract because what makes up that thirty-five million is the maintenance for the maintenance and the and the asset itself. That's what makes up the five million. But looking at it. In, in the line four, he said that if the customer had got another vendor for the repairs and maintenance, the customer would have been paying 10 million. That is, that is the, if the maintenance agreement is no more there, the, it would have, he would be paying 10 million. So that means there is a service agreement and there's a lease agreement in this contract. So thank you very much. I think uh, we have gotten three opinions, I think. So if you look at it very well, there is actually a, a lease of the fibers. That one we all agreed on. It. But you see, as part of the agreement, there's also repairs and maintenance. But that does not stop the owners of the, of the uh, agreement, the customer. It doesn't stop them from going to go and get another person to come and repair for them. But you see, they have to pay the full 35 million, whether they like it or not. So it is all within the same contract, but you see, there are two contracts. There's a lease of the fiber and there's repairs and maintenance. The standard requires that at that inception, you are supposed to separate the lease agreement from the non-lease agreement. So in this one now, there are two agreements, lease agreement and a service agreement. However, if it is not expedient, meaning you cannot separate it, then you can leave everything and account for it at the lease. This one, you can actually split it. How do we split lease from non-lease? The way you split it is to go and say, what is the fair value of the repairs and maintenance contract if we're doing it separately? If you can get the value for such, then the lease agreement is 25 million, and the remaining 10 million is the repairs and maintenance. You need to account for them separately. Do you understand that? 
I want to I want to know whether we understand it. Do we understand? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So I, I think I can proceed to the next one. I think somebody has a question. Uh, let me try this before I proceed. Okay. Somebody has a question. Okay. Somebody said yes. So let's go. On. Now we have been able to identify lease term. At uh, least what leases. Now we can identify leases. Next thing now is that since we can identify leases. What are the list? How do we identify the term of a list? So we have been able to identify leases. But now let's talk about the list term. Now, before now, if I take a if I, I don't let me go back here. If I take a lease, rent, we are leasing um, um, a building for three years. That is what is inside the agreement. But inside the agreement, they also put it there that if I want to extend it to, I can extend it. What is the list term? I'm asking us this. What is the list term? Anybody please, can call again, please. Call so, again, please. I am renting, I'm, I'm leasing a particular building for three years. That's the first um, uh, three years. However, inside the agreement, they put it here that I can come back and extend it, however. What is the list term? Please, fire, fire, fire. Talk, you can talk. Uh, you have raised your hand, you can talk, please. Mr. Latwinti, you can talk. Hello, okay. The list term is three years because uh, after three years, it's optional for the customer to take Additional lease or not? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll talk about it again. Uh, Madam Comfort, you can talk. I can see you raising your hands. That's why. Uh, any other person wants to say something? What's the list time in the uh, question I just asked? Uh, is the list time is three years. Okay. As agreements. Any extension? I think should be after the expiry of the, uh, the initial uh, terms. Okay. Okay, so uh, please, I want us to listen very well because uh, what you just said now is under IS 17. It's not the same thing under IS 16. Please, I want to explain very well. Please listen. And what I'm explaining to you, um, I have helped different companies to, to correctly state them. So, the truth, under IFRS 16, your lease term is not just the non-cancellable period. Please hear me very well. That three years is what they call the non-cancellable period. That was the guidance under IFRS 17. Under IFRS 16, eh, the lease term is the non-cancellable period plus period covered by an option to extend if it is reasonably sure that you exercise it. In addition to that, period covered by an, by an option to terminate if it is reasonably sure that you will do that. Did you, I'm going to explain what I just said with a real life example. Do you understand the English of the standard first? Do you understand? Did somebody just say yes or no? Yes, yes. Now, I'm going to paint an example with bank for you. So, I helped the bank, um, or our friend helped the bank to do this conversion some months ago for their 2019 year. Now, the bank has branches. Those branches, they are on rent. Their auditor was KPMG. We are their... We are the ones that help them to, to prepare financial statement and to and liaise also with their auditor and also because of issues. Now, so we wanted to apply that standard, and they have branches. You see those branches? Inside, they have different rent agreement. Some of them they put two years there, some of them three years, some of them four years. Based on the standard, those two years, three years, four years, that is the non-cancellable period. You see, the assumption will now be 
there is an option to extend. But the standard now said, if it is reasonably certain, the question is, how do you determine if it is reasonably certain that they will exercise the option? Because you need to quantify the period over which they will extend it, if it is reasonably so. How do you understand what the English I just said? Now, how do we know whether it is reasonably sure? Now, let me give you examples of things that will tell you that you are, even when you have not gotten to the future, we, we just paid for two years. But we are now saying, after that two years, are we going to extend it? You are not sure. The standard is now saying, quantify whether you will be sure in the next two years. How do you do that? So we are going to ask ourselves questions like, do we intend to extend it? How do we know, even if we don't know a yes or no? For example, if it is our major business, our management is not building any other branch around that place yet. We have not even bought a land for the branch. Not to talk about building a branch. So management is not intending to even move that branch at all. If they've not started building anything, it shows that even if management has not said a yes or a no, they intend to exercise the extension in the next two years, even if they have not said yes. Because there's no work to ensure that they will move there in the next two years. One, if there's a... Very, it's very important to you, that underlying asset, to your operation, and you have no process of changing that, there might be an option to extend that you want to take. Number two, if, for example, there is actually the cost of relocating to you or the cost of saying, I'm not using you again, I want to use another one, is very, very high. So much that the company might not be able to afford it but stay where they are. That is also showing that even if we have not gotten to that two years, you will extend. Three, if, for example, if you have done a lot of improvement in that place when you were paying for the two years, that is so large that we all know that you are doing it not for the next two years, but for the next 10 years. So all of this kind of thing is what we will consider. And now be able to answer the question that do we have an option to extend? And is it probable that we will extend it? So for example, in the real life situation I'm talking about, after that non cancellable period of four years, we have to now extend and now say, okay, well, there's no development process for another branch in this area. Management intends to continue. That means that there's every possibility that they will extend for another four years. Meaning that in this term, will now be eight years, even if the money they paid was for four years. Do you understand my English? Now I have spoken so much English. This one, do you understand it? Because that is the major change between our system. And I, yes, we understand. So that means that the lease period is the non cancellable period plus the period of the option to extend. If it is reasonably sure you will extend it, and I've given you examples of how you will determine that. Three, if there is also an option to terminate, and it is reasonably sure that you will terminate, you also factor that in. So your lease term is not what you sign. Your list term is what you sign in addition with all of these things I just said. So let us move on because of our time. So if there's no questions around the list term, I believe you understand. Uh, any questions, please? Any questions on this, please? You can, you can fire, uh, Mr. Lot, will you fire? Okay, what about a building where you do not have the right to sublet, but you have the right to only use for yourself? So, do you have 
control over thoughts within me. So, least is not the right to submit. Least is the right to use, number one. So, for example, let us assume that we have a complex and your own office is just one of the wings out of a um, 20 story building. Now, remember, there are two things we need to put into perspective parameters to determine if it's a lease or not. Number one, do we have economic, substantial economic benefit of the use of that asset? What is the asset? The asset is not the whole building. No. The asset is that wing that you rented. Do you have right on the substantially on the economic benefit from using that place? Yes. Am I right or wrong, sir? Mr. Alatunji, I'm going to answer your question. Okay, so I believe he's right. Yeah, right. Okay, then the second thing here is that can we control the asset? What is the asset? The asset is that wing, not the whole building. You know. Can I say that that particular place I've rented, rather than using it for consulting business, now I want to use it to be watching television. Will they send you out if you start putting television there and watching it? If the answer is yes, that means you can control it. If those two things are in place, it is a lease. So you don't need to be able to have right to sublet. Lease is the right to use. Have I been able to explain, sir? Okay, sir. Okay. So, any other questions, please? Because now we have been able to know what the list term, how to calculate the list term. List term is not just the non cancelable period. List term is plus minus, plus option to extend, minus option to terminate. So, let us, okay. Uh, Madam Comfort, fire. Okay, it's just an extension to uh, Mr. Latunji's question. Mm -hmm. However, in my own thinking, the ability to sublet the asset, part of the uh, uh, building, is still a way of deriving economic benefit from mm -hmm. it. But you are not, it, it is not until you are able to sublet that you can recognize it as a lease. That is the contribution I want to. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Additions, subtractions, questions, answers before we move to the next one. So we have been able to, one, learn how to identify leases. Two, learn how to determine lease time. We need to go to the third one. The third one now, if no question, is how do we account for it from the lessee's perspective? And how do we account for it from the lessor's perspective? Lessee is the person that is leasing. Lessor is the person that, sorry, the person that is collecting the asset is the lessee. That means it's the person paying the renter. Lessor is the person that is giving out the asset and the person collecting the renter on the asset. So from the lessee, you are the one collecting the asset. How do we account for it? Let's go straight in. Now, I'm going to do some mathematics and I'll be using Excel. So please, it's a very practical class. If you have your system with you, you can, if you have any question when I'm doing this thing, please ask me. Now, in the book of the lessor or lessee, the moment you have a lease, you must recognize two things at inception. You must recognize the right of use asset and a lease liability. You must recognize a right of use asset and a lease liability. Let us start with what is the right of use asset. Now, I'm going to open an Excel sheet. Please, can you see this Excel sheet? What can you see, please? I want somebody to talk. I 
I need somebody to talk with. What can you see? Hello, talk. You can fire, please. What can you see? We can we can see your screen, but there's no exact there in the explanation. Okay, uh, so I want to be sure what you are saying, really. Uh, uh, I think. I'm going to share my screen and share. Okay. So can you can you see an Excel? Can you see an Excel sheet? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah we can see yes. it now. Okay. So I'm going to. So I'm going to tell you what you will recognize. So I said you will recognize when there's a lease contract. Two things at inception. You will recognize a right of use asset. And in addition to that, you will recognize what a lease liability. I'm going to create examples for all of this. And then, so let us assume that we are leasing what is right of use asset. Right of use assets to calculate it, please. Watch is the present value of all lease payments. Let, 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 uh, okay. I'm going to go back to the slide and share the slide. Can you see the slide? Yes, okay. we can. Okay. So I'll just annotate here so that you can see what I mean. Uh, I will type here. So please watch. Can you see what I'm typing, please? If I say right of use asset, what is right of use asset? Please just listen to me. Right of use asset is the PV of all lease payments or lease rental. After the lease inception, the meaning of this is that if I have a lease of a building, the present value of all the lease payments I will pay in the future, not the one I'm paying now. Please, did you get what I just said? For example, I have the lease of a, of a building. The lease term, based on our assessment, is six years. I have only paid for, or the lease term is two years. I have only paid for one year. What I will put do PV for is only the one I have not paid. And when I intend to pay it, did you get that, please? That yes, is sir. one. The second thing, because it's an addition, is also any payment made on and before lease inception. What is the meaning of this? Meaning, before we started the lease, I pay you one money. You say I should pay a money, then. I pay it. You say I should pay uh, the lease money, I paid it. Be that day or before that day that the lease is started, that is also part of the right of use asset. In addition to that, what is also still there? If there are directly attributable costs, I will print examples real life so that you get what I'm saying. Directly attributable costs like cost of carriage. For example, the car we want to lease is in the UK. 
and they need to bring it from the UK to Nigeria. The cost of moving that asset is also part of the what? The right of use asset. In addition, the estimates for the commissioning, the assets, if there is a legal or constructive obligation to the commission in the future, like rigs, you also need to add that. Now, so that it will be very understandable, I need to now paint it in real English. Let's look at an example. Let's look at an example. I'm going to go to Excel now. So that I can now put this in English. So let us assume an agreement, a lease agreement. In this lease agreement, they said we will be paying 10, 10 million, or 10, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, as the lease payment. So we are paying a lease on the use of the assets, lease payment. And it is 10, 10 million. At the beginning of the lease, they say we have to pay a down payment, down payment, or first payment. And the first payment was 20 million, one, two, three, one, two, three. In addition to that, they now said, at the end of the lease, we would have to pay another in year five. In addition to the lease payment for that year, we will pay another 10, 5 million. Do you understand this agreement I have drafted here? Please, I want a yes or a no. Really. Do you understand this example I've painted? No. Okay. So, we are leasing a car or train. In the lease agreement, we are to pay 20 million naira now. Then every year, for the use of the asset, we will be paying 10, 10 million naira. Then at the end, in year five, because they are going to be transferring the asset to us, like a finance lease, they ask us to pay 5 million naira for the use of the asset. Do you understand the agreement? Please, do you understand? I need us to understand before I begin to calculate. Yes. He said? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Any other person, please? I just want to hear the echo of yes or no, so that I would know what I will do before I go on. Bukola, yes. do, okay. Bukola, do you understand? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, how do we calculate the right of use asset? Let us assume in addition to this, there is also carriage. Because the car is coming from England, the train is coming from England, we would have to pay 3 million naira for carriage at the beginning, before they will even bring the asset to us. What is the right of use asset for me? Please watch very well. Right of use asset. Now, I said the right of use asset, the first one is what? PV of all payments 
after leave it. Now, what rate will I use? The standard requires that you use the your what is it, your um, incremental costs, your borrowing incremental cost to do this. That's the, that's the easiest one to use. And how do I get my borrowing incremental cost? It means if it were that I wanted to borrow money from the bank, this 10, 10 million naira, how much or how much interest would I have been paying? That is your borrowing cost. Do you understand what I just said? Yes. Okay. So that is the borrowing cost that we would have to use. So now what particular, so let us assume I am your, uh, your incremental borrowing cost. Let us assume that it is 10% in this example. In this example, I want to do. So it's 10%. So what is the PV of the lease payment? It will be equals to, please watch, PV, open brackets, what is the rate? 10%. Comma, what is NPER, number of period? Is five years. Comma, what is the PMT, periodic payment? It is 10, 10 million naira. Comma, future value, zero, type, zero, close bracket. The PV of all of my lease payment is 37, 907, 868. Please, if you don't understand anything I've done, please tell me. It is very easy. With Excel, straightforward. Because the functions are there. Please, no. please call me again. I am deleting it. I'm using Excel. If you have your ex um, uh, ex system open, please, whenever we are in the future, too, whenever this, they are all practical classes, so we need to have our system in it. So how do I calculate the PV of all payments in the future? Remember, what is the payment in the future here? Is the least payment I'll be paying at the end of the year. And how much is it? 10 million naira. So I'll pay 10 million naira, end of year one, year two, year three. So I put equals to, and the moment I type PV in Excel, equals to PV, open bracket. Let me open it up for you from here. See, this is the function on Excel. It says, what is the rate? What is the rate that we say we'll use? I want us to talk so that we know whether we are together. What is the rate we are supposed to use? 10%. So I click on this 10%. NPER in this PV function means number of period. In this example I'm using here, how many years is the least payment we are supposed to pay? Five years. Five. So I will type five today. PMT means periodic payment. In this example we are doing here, how much are, are we paying periodically? 10 million. Wonderful. 10, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Future value. In this example here, future value means what are we going to pay at the end of this contract? Are we going to pay anything again? In this example I painted, no. are we going to pay anything? At the end? No. Yes, now. No. no. I said at the end, in year five, you will pay five million naira. Okay. Now, the, yes. I, I printed an example like as if um, there's a right for you to buy the asset. A right of purchase. So at that end, you are paying five million naira and they will be giving you the car. And you will be carrying it away. So that five million naira is what I'm typing here. Five, one, two, three, one, two, three. This type... It means whether payments are made at the beginning or at the end. In this example I printed here, payment is made at the end. So in Excel, if you type zero, it will be using at the end of the period. If you type one, it will be using at the beginning of the period. So I'm using end. The thing is here, is the explanation is here. So I'm using end of the period, so I type zero. And I say, okay, that is what it has given me here. This is the PV of all the list payments. Do you understand now? 
Yes. Yes. Ezra. Okay. So, sorry, can you explain it again? I can explain. So, I'm going to type it again. So, it's equals to P. I'm sorry, you were yeah. explaining money that equals to P. Okay. The open bracket. When you open this bracket in Excel, you can click this FX. If you click this FX, the moment you click this FX, this thing will come out. What rate are we using? 10%. What is the number of the period? Five years. What is the periodic payment? The periodic payment is 10 million. What is the future value? <coughs> Meaning what you are paying in the future. At the end, we are paying 5 million based on this question. What is the type? Type is either you are making periodic payment at the beginning of the period of each year or at the end. If you are doing it at the beginning of the period, you will put one. If you are using at the end of the period, you put zero. If I type zero and I say, okay, that is all. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. Okay, so that is right of use assets, PV of payment. Two, in addition to PV of payment, I said it is all of the payments made before or at lease date. All the payments you have made before the lease date on the same list or the one that you are paying for what? At that lease date. In this example I painted, which of the money here are you paying now? The down payment. Wonderful. So I'll put this down payment here. No PV for that one. Why? Because you are paying it now, now, now. That's why we are yes. not doing PV for it. It is now. In addition, number three, I said it is also all the directly attributable costs. In this example here, what is the directly attributable cost? Three million. One Three million. So our right of use asset is equals to all of this. This is our right of use asset. Do you understand? This is our right of use asset. Now remember, I said there are two things you must find. I said, right of use asset and what? At initial right of use and what? Lease liability. Lease liability. Wonderful. So let us calculate lease liability now. So what is lease liability? Lease liability is equal to PV of all payments after the lease date. Now, this includes PV of lease rentals plus PV of unguaranteed or guaranteed future payment. Future or residual payment. Now, what do I mean by residual payment? Residual payment could be that they said, oh, it is like this uh, year five payment that I say they should pay. In addition to that, it also includes payments for exercising options in the future when i mean options here yeah, there are two options is either option to buy option to extend or option to even terminate the contract all of this together is how you calculate lease liability now i'm going to calculate lease liability for the one that is up here now so in the one that is up here the pv of the lease payments just the same way I calculated before, is equal to PV. What are the payments? Is ten percent number of period five years PMT 
it is 20 million. Future value, meaning how much are you paying in the future? It is 5 million and the five time million. is zero. It is exactly the same thing that I have here. This, all this one, I don't have this one effectively because I put them inside this one. So that means my uh, lease liability is equal to what? Please, can you see what I'm doing? Do you understand yes. this? Now, next thing I would now like to do is to pass the accounting entries. Do you understand what I've done up to this point before I pass the accounting entries? Yes. Yes. So now let us pass accounting entries. I will now say debit credit right of use asset and lease liability. Our right of use asset will be debit of this amount at inception. Our lead liability will be credit of this 41 at inception. Remember, at inception, we already paid this 20 million naira. Am I right? Yes. yes. So we'll say, bank, that we are paying what? We are paying 20 million naira. In addition to that, we also have add what? Carriage expenses. Am I right? Yes. How much was the carriage expenses? Yes. Three million. If I add Three them, million. you will discover that it will balance without any issues. Can you see? It, eh? it will balance. So remember, this one is supposed to be a, a money is going out. Money is going out for the two. It's, it's credit. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Bank. What are we paying for in this bank? Carriage. Do you I'm trying to separate it so that you will be able to see. What are we paying for here? We are paying for, uh, what is the first one we pay for? Um, down payment. Down payment. payment. Uh, so that we will just see the description. And I will not know. Uh, up front. Anything. <laughs> you the moment you understand. Okay. So if we add it together, you will discover that it will balance. Do you understand? This is what we pass at the beginning of the list. Any question? <sighs> Any questions? Are we still here? Any questions? Uh, hello? Hello, sir. Hello. Fire. Fire. Uh, just, what just uh, in case. In case, okay. uh, you know, in, uh, in, in, in case, let's just, it may be an assumption or just any other. In case, because the representation here, let's speak it from, for example, from financial angle now. The, the, um, the focus of this account here as a balance now. Let's say in case, if there is anything that causes it not to balance, for example, what like do you think? <laughs> okay, I, 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 I think the only thing that causes it not to balance is if it is not well understood. Because there's no way to not balance. That's what I'm trying to say. There's no, uh, you know, whenever you see any account, okay. like, are you buying uh, Hello, a, sir. I'm listening, sir. For example, now, let me pick it from the area of financing costs of that, let's say, 10%. Yes. Is it not possible in future, maybe um, uh, due to uh, or whatever, and then that interest rate changes? Oh, yes. That is what they call the assessment. I will get there. Okay. I will get to the assessment. But at okay. the beginning, eh, it will be correct. Later, if the rate change, I will now teach how to do it. Okay. So, right. sir, uh, you have a, a question, sir. Uh, you have somebody had a, a, a question. Any other question, please, Mr. Alatunji? I think you had the question. No, 
My question is that what about if you pay your landlord everything at the beginning? Will you still calculate the liability? So if you are saying that the money you are paid, you will never, never extend it. I mean that you will never, it is only that period that is your lease payment or your lease term, then there's no liability. Uh, ah. Because most landlord, most landlord collect in advance. Yes. However, what we are now going to say is that, is that your lease term? Because you know you are paid for two years, but you, are, uh, you, are, you still have an intention to, use the, to be in the place for the next 10 years. So your lease term is 10 years. What you are paying for is two years. So you need to actually do an assumption of the fact that after the first two years, you will pay another rent. Then you will pay another rent in year six. Then you will pay another rent in year eight. Then you will pay another rent in year ten. All of those ones is the one that you will do pay before. Okay, but you will not know the, Yes, but you will not know the price the that, landlord will, will come with in the next four years. You are very correct, sir. So that is why it's an estimate. So you will so in practice. What is being used is that you either use exactly what you have or you use it progressively with an increment based on the experience. For example, last two years, it was one million. Last three, uh, four years, it was 800,000. There's always a 20% increase. That is the kind of thing that is required. Okay. Any question on this is the accounting for Lizzie at initial recognition? I believe you understand. Let's now take it a step further. The moment you have passed these accounting entries, you see, does anybody have any question? Yeah, yes, sir. I have something to say. Sorry. Please, fire. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear. Okay, just for fun, actually, uh, I want to ask this: the right of use assets, and yes. it, it will be recognized like you have a, you are carrying an asset in your books, Abi. It's PP and E from that day. PP. Okay, now you know my what? Why? Why I said that uh, it's actually just for fun. You know the usual thing before before I was assisting is where you have to carry to prepayment and then you amortize over the period of it. So I'm just saying that, don't you think this IFRS system would make a lot of people to be recognizing assets in their book just because they want their account to look robust? I'm just saying, it's actually just, it's just an observation. I'm, I'm just of the opinion that um, people, because you know, um, when you are with addressing your account, I don't you don't you think this uh, um, I find system will make you, uh, a lot of companies will be carrying assets in their books and uh, just for them to look uh, buoyant. Okay, so let me ask you a question Do you think that car that you actually that I've been using as an example since is it an asset to you or not an asset to this person that we are counting it for? Do you think it's an asset or not an asset? Because before now, you have been carrying as a prepayment. Am I correct? Yes, please. Okay, so based on the guidance under IA 16, it is that it becomes a tangible asset or PP and E if it is tangible and we know that economic benefit will flow to you in more than 12 months and you know what the cost is, then you recognize PP and E. That's the guidance under IA 16 even before now. So let us look at that repayment that we have been carrying. Don't you think we have been understating the financial statement by saying that that car that we are driving is only prepayment? And in your yes. books, it, it will never be depreciated. I'm just even okay. explaining to you the reason why they moved. Okay, um, I'm, I'm looking at it from the angle of where you are paying rent on okay. a property. Eh? Okay. Let me give you an instance. I also note that um, is not um, IFRS system gives liberty for you to either uh, apply IFRS system on some of your lease agreements. So let me just paint the picture for you, sir. If you are paying rent, 
usually okay let me just use an example in my own organization we have we have small small offices around where we just rent a small office space and then um, usually the rent being paid is just for one year max two years and then um, we're talking about ifr 16 now so i'm just of the opinion that um, if you are paying rent for just one year don't you think or is it not proper to just classify it as a prepayment that you're making an advance mm -hmm. payment and then you are you are just spreading the cost over the period of the 12 months so i'm just saying mm -hmm. i understand yes. if i understand i'm just trying to say that it is another avenue or ways for company to now begin to go under and then begin to carry assets in their books that are not really so to say that it's something that shouldn't be a, a, a classified as an asset. Okay. I, I understand you quite well. Now, number one, mm -hmm. we will even get there. Number one, you cannot choose to say I want to do IFR 16 or not. The only things that you don't need to do it for is no value asset. We'll, we'll get there when I will explain it to you now. It's either okay, let's move on. Is a low-valued asset or short-term lease? Okay. Now, short-term lease is not lease for when you will get, when I get here, you will see, you will now discover okay. that uh, what we have been doing might not be very good. So, uh, Abiba, Abib, uh, uh, Abib can you can talk to us? Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. I'm sorry, please. What's the name? Because this, what's the name? Here? Habibullah, Habibullah. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, I just want to raise a confirmation on how to determine the incremental borrowing cost. Because oh, okay. in, in case, for instance now, uh, I, 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 I secure a new lease and, I, and maybe the, the lease term is, uh, let's just say, 10, 10 years. Now, how do I determine the incremental borrowing cost? Because uh, I will I just assume the rate or I that's a, 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 no a no. okay. <laughs> okay. No the, your incremental borrowing rate is the rate you would have actually gotten a loan or a facility from the commercial bank if it were that you wanted to finance that in separate way. So for example, it is the commercial bank rate for that kind of loan, for that kind of period, with that kind of time. You understand? Okay, sir. Is but, effectively but, your is effective the prime lending rate. Go to the okay. prime lending rate from from CDL for okay. for that particular kind of period. That is all. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's what I want to get clarification. No. Because currently we have different rates uh, from the commercial banks, so mm -hmm. I expect we should have a, a unified uh, oh, rate. So, so let me tell you period. practice. In practice, okay. and when I'm talking practice now, I'm talking what we have done. So KPMG will accept from you because, for example, what we what we do is we say okay, well, from First Bank, from uh, First Bank Union Bank, just get like three banks and say okay, okay what is the rate uh, of five year loan? This one thirty percent, this one twenty five percent, this one twenty seven percent. Go an average of it. Do you understand? Yes, that is one way of doing it. Another way is just that you just go to the CBN and just pick the maximum lending rate. Move on. Any questions? Okay, another question, sir. Yes. Sir. In case uh, for maybe I've uh, secured a list and my list, maybe the list period is 10 years, for instance, and I have a down payment for ten for five years out of the out of the 10 years. So now it is it's, it's stated in the list contract that uh, my 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 lease payment after this first payment will have uh, an incremental of 15 percent so okay. that 15 percent how will i treat it in this uh, 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 scenario and uh, so remember that i talked about the pv of all the payments after the lease date so that means that your next lease payment will be 15 percent on what you actually paid before so when you are doing that pv it will be pv of what you paid before plus 15 percent do you understand? Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So let us move on because of our time. So the moment you have passed this entry, this is initial recognition. I will call it IR. Subsequently, after initial recognition, what do you start doing? After
after year one, or immediately after initial recognition, this one that we call right of use asset, you will now begin to account for it using IEA 16. Please, do you understand? I, can you see my screen, please? Yes, sir. So, henceforth, from, to, from this date, you will forget that that asset is illegal. I.e., it is IEA 16 that will be in charge of it. All. Like the question I got about the fact that is this thing not window dressing? Sorry. Uh, is that IEA 16 or IEA 16? IEA 16. PP is still IEA 16. Okay, okay, okay. Not IEA, not least. Uh, PPE, okay. uh, PPE. Okay. So, okay. under PPE, what will be the, you know, under PPE, the question is that over what period are we going to depreciate it? Please, are you listening to me, please? <laughs> because I need to explain yes, this thing very well. So, when you are using IES 16, the question will now be, what is the useful life? Now, there are two conditions here. If you intend to continue to use the asset and even take over the asset after the lease, then your useful life, the useful life of the asset will be the basis of the depreciation. However, if it were that we are saying that we will not take over the asset, i.e., is as if at the end of the lease term, we will say we are okay, we will return the car back to them. It is the lower of the useful life and the lease term that will be our depreciation period. Do you understand what I just said? Now, yes, I, no, I don't know whether we understand because me myself, I sound as if I'm, I'm of the opinion that you don't understand. Please, do we understand what I just said? I understand. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bumi, do you understand? I'm looking for... Um, uh, Please, come again. Yes, I want to come again. I want to even get permission to come again. So, this is what I mean. Um, to say, when it is under IES 16, two conditions could apply. The first condition is that let me type it so that it will, it will be more understandable. The first condition could be that we intend to use purchase option, purchase or extension option. So meaning that the least time that we have is not what we want to use alone. We want to continue using it. If that is the case, it is our useful life, the useful life of the assets that will determine it. And I will explain that in a couple of minutes. Now, when I say useful life, you know, useful life under IES 16, it means period over which management wants to use derive economic benefit. For example, what is the useful life of a car in your company? Many cars, companies will say four years. Oh, but yes, you know yes. that. That four years, that car self, somebody has used it for 20 years before. So the economic life of a car is not four years. It is the useful life in your own company that is four years. Do you understand that? Yes. Yeah. So what we are using in IES 16 is not economic life. Economic life is bigger. Economic life is the period over which that asset can give you benefits. You see a car, you still see a uh, <laughs> 1999 lights is today. And so it means that the economic life is not four years, even if the IPR are four years in your company. What is four years is the useful life, which is the period over which management wants to derive economic benefit. So the moment you have an asset under right of use asset, uh, or right of use asset, you will now ask yourself a question. Over what period does management want to derive economic benefit from this car? That is now what we will use to start depreciating. Do you understand? Yes, very okay. well. So the next option is now let us assume that we do not intend to extend in any way. If we don't intend to extend in any way, the useful life 
will be, or what you will depreciate with will be lower of lease term lease term and useful life. The essence of this is so that you will never extend the lease term if you don't intend to extend it. Do you understand what I mean? So let me paint a scenario with the first one. You have leased a car for two years, but it is highly probable that we'll pay another two, two years on that car. And at the end of the second year, uh, second two years we are paying, we are going to take over the car. So our lease term or our depreciation period will not be the first two years we are paid for. Because what would determine it is the useful life. And the useful life is the period over which management wants to derive economic benefit. So we can say it's four years. But in a situation where we do not intend to extend, we have only paid for two years, the depreciation period will be the lower of the lease term and the useful life. What is the lease term in the one I just created? The first lease term, two years. Do you understand what I mean? Hello? Yeah. So, yes. So, yes, yes. So that is the that is the way you will start depreciating it. The lease liability, you will now begin to do it. It will now begin to give us it, the lease liability. This particular first one, P P and E. For P P and E, from that day, inside statement of financial position, you will have P P and E as a balance. Inside uh, P and L you will have depreciation. For the lease liability, inside statement of financial position, you will have lease liability as a balance. And inside P and L, what are you going to have? Interest, interest, expense. Do you understand? Or interest cost. Now, how do you calculate that interest cost? He said, lease interest. Yes, lease interest. How do you calculate that interest? Please watch. Please watch. You see, like I explained, this training is a very, very practical training. Nothing hidden. We will just explain it as simple as that. Now, you must have done a computation at the beginning of the contract. Now, please watch period, opening balance, interest, repayment, and closing balance. The period is between zero and five in this thing that we have done. This is the basis of the accounting entries for interest, interest, interest. Opening balance of the lease liability is how much? 41. So I'm going to put my cursor and click enter. 41 million. Wonderful. Closing balance is equals to opening balance plus interest minus repayment. Opening balance in subsequent period will always be equal to closing balance in previous period. I drag down this understanding. Just watch very well. Repayment, if you can remember, repayment we said is equals to 10, 10 million every year. Can you remember? 10, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Can you remember? So I drag yes. everything down. However, in the fifth year, remember that we are going to pay additional 20 million. Yes. So that means down payment. In the, not down payment. You know, how much are we paying in the fifth year, please? Five million. Five million, five, not twenty million. Five million, five million. So I'm going to. That means in the fifth year here, it should be ten million plus five million. Wonderful. You will see that this thing will balance by itself. And interest is equals to opening balance times ten percent. Abi, that's what we use yes. before. If I drag yes. this thing down, it must balance. If it doesn't balance, if it is wrong, it is wrong. If it's right, it's right. Eh? Now, if this, can you see this interest that is here? That is the least, in, least interest you'll be passing on. 
So you see this 41 that is here. If I pass this interest into it and we are removing repayments, your closing balance at the end will give you zero. So at the end of year one, our lease payment or lease interest, interest expense, it will be equal to this one. And it will be going to lease liability. The other side. And when payment is made, when we make payments, we will now say bank 10 million, one, two, three, one, two, four. And we will at the same time also say lease liability is how much? 10 million. Mm -hmm. Now, if you watch this, I want you to watch this and you will discover it to give me the same thing with the schedule. Opening balance. Hello, Hello sir. Yes, please, fire. Yeah, you said the account entry for the payment, the subsequent payment of that 10 million. Yes, that is what I was. I was supposed to debit bank or credit bank. Sorry. And debit, I'm and credit debit, uh, bank. Sorry. List, list yes, yes, list. you are correct. You are correct. You are correct. So, now watch this so that you will see that it's correct. Opening balance. We started with this amount, am I right? Yeah. Inside this liability. Then there was interest expense. Interest was increasing it by 4 million. Then there was repayment. Repayment was reducing it by 10 million. That's the debit. What is the closing balance? Sum it up. It will give you exactly the same thing that you have here. Can you see this 35133 in the schedule? Can you see this 35? Mm. It will give you exactly the same thing. That is what the essence of this schedule is. At the end of the life of the lease, it must give you any question. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, can you move the slide to oh, yeah. the right? The right. Okay. Yes, right. There's a question. Please, Baya. We are very happy to. Okay, the question is what about if the 10% is That's only thing. for the first year? The second year, you have 12% interest. I will in get there. I will get them. Okay. That's what they call reassessment. I think I will explain the assessment. That's what I asked the other time. You are very correct. They call it reassessment, and I will explain it. Do you understand? So I have taught lease accounting, lease accounting at initial recognition and subsequent measurement. Do you understand? Yes, sir. This year's need will be loud. <laughs> but it's very, very understandable. Hope we are trying to do the same thing. Because I won't like to all of these things on Nigeria. Uh, Probably subsequent one to just pick up our system so that we can we can just do the same thing. So I believe you understand this. I want to go back to this slide so that I can just run through some of the things on the slides and uh, uh, you can just understand. Yeah. Thank you. There's a much. question, sir. Please fire. Yeah. Uh, like uh, this, uh, I'm uh, the charges of this interest now. Yes. You know, you charge for, for four million in a, on a on a monthly basis. Yeah, in case you know, of I did this one here. So that's what I'm saying. Can we is there any way we can do it on a monthly basis? Because yes, if you are preparing your money now account on a monthly basis. So you yeah. know you have to be and so rather than your, having you know it's zero to five because it's five years. So if I'm doing per month, it will be zero to sixty. Sixty okay. Yeah. okay. And the rate will be that ten percent divided by twelve. Do you understand what I mean? No 10% is annual, I need to okay, make it to the Okay, not acting. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, that is that. So let us go back to the slide. Can you see the slide, please? Yes, sir. Okay, so I have explained everything on initial recognition, subsequent measure, initial record, everything. So let me ask this very um this question that we have tell me whether this is supposed to be part of the computation of right of use asset maintenance cost should it be inside the right of use asset is it in or out okay insurance cost should it be in or out out fixed lease payment in or out 
In. Variable list payment in or out? Out. In. Okay, so somebody said in, somebody in. said out. It's out. Okay, sir. So whether it is variable or fixed, as far as it's a list payment, it will be in. Do you understand? Whether it's very fixed or variable, it will be in, as far as it was list payment. Exercise price of a purchase option in or out. In. Out. Okay, so it will be in. Remember that we said that the right of use asset, you must factor in even the probability that they will use the purchase option in the future and do the PV, so it is in. Terminal penalty, in or out? In. Oh. in. Conditional reassessment cost, in or out? That's one of the reassessments you are talking about. No, that's not reassessment. That, that, is, is that one is re. This one is free. <laughs> in or out? In. Okay, okay, in, in. Okay, because you said conditional pre. Yeah, so when yeah. You say conditional, that means if you don't do it, we will not go buy the asset. Or we will yeah. not release the asset. Carry it cost, in or out? In. in. So at this point, I think that makes sense. In. So let's now talk about what are those things? Because somebody already said it uh, while we're doing this, that you can decide not to do all of this IFRS system for a lease. And I explained, you can only do that if it is lease of short term. Lease of short term is not one year lease. -o. I need to explain that again. Lease of short term is a lease it's less than one year. Wonderful of 12 months or less. Now, listen to me. However, if you have an intention to, to, to purchase a lease option or a, sorry, a purchase option or an extension option, it is no longer a short-term lease. So for example, you lease a place for 12 months. And inside that thing, there is a, an extension option. Hmm. And we know that it is, the moment there's an extension option inside, which you could use, even if you have only paid for 12 months, it is not short term lease again, no? Since it is it's exceeded 12 months. Since it is possible that it could exceed it. It has not exceeded it yet. You know, you only paid for 12 months. But it is possible that you will pay another one. It is not a short term lease again. So you Sorry. cannot hide. Okay, please ask your question. Sorry, you said you said um, a short term lease is not a lease of uh, one year. I said it's that not, was not what you said. No, no, let me rephrase myself. A short term lease is any lease of period of 12 months or less. However, okay, so the okay. moment there is a purchase option or an extension option on that contract, it is not a short term lease. Okay, that was exactly what I was trying to tell you then that the most of our rent are rent that falls within 12 calendar months. That is what I was trying to say earlier. Okay, but can are they not going to extend it? Are they not going to pay for another one after one year? Uh, the possibility of paying for another year is, is, is there. Hey, that's yeah. what I'm saying. That the moment that possibility is there, it is no longer a short term lease. Yeah. Short term lease, okay. That's okay. what I'm trying that's, to say. Because this that, that, that is what a lot of companies were trying to hide on that. But it's already taking okay. care of inside the contract, inside the um, inside the standard. So, but okay. Esther, in case <laughs> in case this uh, after the twelve month, there was not any concrete. There is not any documented agreement that say okay, there's an option of extension. But invariably. There's always extension on that lease. So how do we do that? Remember, like I explained, IFRS is substance over form. Even if we don't have an agreement, remember they said that if there's a, an option and it is reliably, like there's a probability that you will use it, there might not have been an agreement that you have signed. But we know, and they gave us different things that are pointers. 
towards the fact that we might extend it. I said, for example, if your business is, a, is dependent on that team, I gave you an example, a real life example of some of these uh, banks, branches. Those branches, inside the agreement, they didn't say they will extend it. But they know, everybody knows that there's no plan to have another branch in the next one year. Even if there's a plan that they are building, a, uh, having a building, the team, you cannot start a building today and finish that branch in the next 12 months. So because of that, that, that that's the kind of thing to assess. So you don't need an agreement that says we will extend it in 12 months. So that means we should always be considering the, the substance over form of all contracts. Wonderful. That's the English in summary. So, in addition to that, lease for which the underlying asset is low, low value, you can also say that you are not going to use all of these ones that we are talking. Now, how do you know low value asset? Now, let me paint low value asset to you so that you will not say a car is low value asset. Even if you buy, you bought the car for 20,000 naira, it is not a low value asset. Though. So how do you know a low value asset? If the money you will use to buy an asset that you are calling a low value asset, if, if or buy a new one of that asset is substantially more or much, it is not a low value asset. Let me paint it in English. Your friend sold you a, an Islander 2018 model for 20,000 Naira. It is not a low value asset. Do you understand my English? Yes. Do you understand me, please? Expand shade the more, sir. Okay. So you know that if it were that you wanted to buy another Islander of 2016 model, you will not buy it for 20,000 naira. Am I correct? Yes, yes, yes. But because it's your friend, he sold it for you for 20,000 naira. So if the value if it were that you are buying a new one of that thing that you are calling a low value asset is substantially more than the amount that you are booking it, then it is not a low value asset. Okay, okay, bravo. So, if, so low value assets are things like phone. If it is a phone, for example, even if, if you buy a, a what do you call that thing? Tokumbo phone for 40,000 naira, the new of the phone can be 70,000, 80,000. Am I right or wrong? Yes. I don't think yeah, what, the what is, eh? the, the answer, what is the standard of a second hand value? It's the same thing we are saying now. That if the if the, the value of the new one of that thing must not be substantially different from that value or that you are booking. So every second hand, it is the moment the value is substantially different, like a car. You have a car that they are selling for you for twenty thousand naira. But if it were that you wanted to buy a new one with 10 million naira, it is not a low value asset. You will not call it a low value asset. But can, aren't we consider the tier and we are value that, that shows the difference between them? And even if you consider it now, it will still be DP and E, meaning that you will still use the full IFRS system. No, these two things are the ones that you say that I don't want to use IFRS system. So if it were that is a phone now, I don't need to do this full life of a system. I don't need to begin to do list liability and right of use assets. I will just apply another thing, which is that I will just spread the payment of the lead on the phone rather than doing all of this one. Do you understand what I just said? Yes, sir. Yeah. So these two short-term lease and lease for which the underlying asset is of low value are the only reasons where we are not going to do all of those lease liability right of use assets. What do you do for these ones? All you have to do is just to spread this straight line or spread it systematically. For example, if you lease a phone, I, I don't know whether they do so much of this in Nigeria, but in other clans, you can actually get a phone and a phone and a service, um, internet and everything, and you're only paying every month. You are paying every month for the next 12 months. So if you have such, 
and it's a phone and you're paying a particular sum of money, what they are saying is that it is a low value asset. You don't need to begin to have this liability and uh, um, right of use asset. All you just need to do is take the value of what you are paying and begin to do straight line and just spread it over and move on. Any questions? Do you understand this place? Okay. So for low value assets, all you need to do is to just spread the payment. What about if the material okay, question please? Question, please. We are listening to you. Hello. We are listening to okay. you. What about what about if the materiality is the company? Some low value asset may be hundred thousand, whereas for a company, low value. Okay, you are talking about materiality, am I right? Yes. Okay, so let us talk materiality. So, number one, the concept of materiality is a, so I was once an auditor, the concept of materiality um, is, is, is very, very, the, from the perspective you are bringing it from, is materiality to test a balance. Am I right or wrong, sir? Yeah, I'm talking about uh, the, if the value of the miss is so small, it's relative to the size of the company. Okay, wonderful. So let us talk about that. So if that is where the low value asset comes. However, let me paint this to you, sir. In some companies, um, they have what they call capitalization um, policy. So for example, if you ever did anything for mobile before, for all of these uh, IOCs, they probably will have like uh, 10000 or $1,000 and say this is our capitalization. So any other thing below that, they expense it. Did you get me, sir? Yes. Okay. So in such a case, you are saying that any, the, any other expense below that is just a normal expense. It's a day-to-day -day normal expense. So that capitalization already drives IEA 16 in many companies. So, it also drives it to it is, it is, it is applicable. So, for example, it is low value is um, is a very very uh, is very subjective. In a company, a, like let's assume a local company um, that is not a local company in uh, a, or a local company in Nigeria in Abidjan. The, the balance sheet size, say it is 10 million. And you have another company, say in uh, 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 any other place, their balance sheet size is uh, five uh, one billion dollars. What they call assets will not be the same thing. So the yes. way that one applies is also the way all of this low value asset applies. So what would be low value asset to Mr. A might not be the same thing to Mr. B. Do you understand me? Because some companies already, as we are talking, the phone is capitalized as PPME. Am I right or wrong, sir? So in such companies, they have not done a wrong thing. To them, it meets the requirement, so they are correct. Any other questions, please? Mr. Adisa, I, I, we, we got your question on the slides. You, you, we will send you a, what is it? A, 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 um, the, you, you are talking about the slides, am I right? So, I can't see. Can you see the, can you see the slides now? I believe you can see it. Any questions again before I move on? Please? Any questions? Uh, Mr. Abibabel, your hand is raised up. You can, you can, you can ask your question, please.
Sorry, that's the initial. Okay, 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 okay. No problem. So can we go on? So that is the short term, short term leads. Um, and so let me ask this question now. The lessee enters into a 12 month lease of a vehicle with an option to extend for 12, another 12 months. The lessee does not have any significant economic incentive to extend the option. Is, he, is this a short term lease or not? It's a short term lease. It is not. Any, any other person? One it is, one it is not. I need somebody to settle it. Is any other person to help us settle it? Uh, it's, it's a short term lease. Since it does not have any significant economic incentive to to do that, so that means yeah, it's at it's 12 months. Okay. So let me go back to the slide again. For short term leases, as far as there's an option, it is no longer a short term lease. Please, I explain that again. Okay. As far as there's an option, it is no longer a short term lease. It's like that 12 months uh, that, that, uh, that one of the people, it is no longer a short term. Oh, so. sir, is it not, is it not that, even, it is it not until when that option comes valid that we can decide that, okay, for example, yes, there is an option, but look at this scenario now. Uh, there is no any significant economic incentive to do that. So what that means in the reality sense is that there is no way this company or this entity can extend that uh, contract beyond the 12 month uh, period. Yeah, so, is it not the okay. option becomes valid, we can consider that as a not a short term lease. Okay, so if you can remember when we started talking about um, the essence of lease term, the reason why we're talking about that this time was so that it will help us to calculate what will be our lease liability and right of use asset. But you know that what this short term lease or no short term lease is used for is to know whether you would even do that computation at all or you would just spread it as straight line. So at this point, you can say that, oh, I, I don't think I'm going to extend it. But the way the standard is, the moment there's an extension right for a 12 month, remember that a short term lease is a lease between zero and 12 months. And remember that the lease term, by definition, also includes the period of the extension. Extension period. Okay, okay. Yeah, yes, so, yes. as a result of the you, if you might be saying, I'm not going to use it today. Then you discover that when you start using yes, it, you, you, you might reconsider. You, are you right. reconsider. At that point, what will now do to the one that you have, you yes. have explained? It's not, it's not short time. Yeah. Okay, that's so, that is that. Yeah. Uh, this case study, I don't think I will say you should do it. It's, it's, it's the one I just did in Excel for you. Um, let's just move on. Because. Uh, so, I've explained all of these things. Right of use asset, after commencement, you do depreciation. Uh, over what period? I've explained all of them in the example. Now, the one I've not explained is reassessment. Now, I know uh, there are two people that ask questions about reassessment. Are they still here? At the minimum, I pray one of them is here. Yes, we are here. Yes, we are here. Yes. Okay, so what is reassessment? So, reassessment will occur. For example, when there is a change in the rate that is determining the amount that will be paid. So you are very correct. Or for example, there is a change in the guaranteed or unguaranteed residual value, i.e. the money that you will pay at the end. If there is a change in any of those two, then we say there is a change in or there is there's a change in reassessment of lease liability. What happens when there's a change in the reassessment? This is what happens. So for example, in year three, you discover that the rates have changed. And as a result of the rate changing, you are paying more. What will happen? Please watch my mathematics because I'm going to do it 
then I will tell you what the accounting entries are. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yes. Let me share my Excel screen. Can you see this Excel screen back? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So let us assume that in, at the end of year three, I'm coloring it so that you, I'm using the same schedule that I've used before. Let us assume that at the end of this year three, the repayment change as a result of the fact that the interest rate change. So let me say this particular one is here. I'm going to put it here again. So I'm just going to put it back on. So this is where it changed. Now, where it changed here, what are the things that really change? Is this repayment? Am I right? So let's assume that the repayment now will be 12, 12 million. But remember that the first three has already gone. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. It's only the future one that we have to consider. So the future one is from here. So this 10 is now 12. 12, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. And this 15 is 12 plus 15. Plus 15. Am I right? 15. Now, that yes, is what yes. has changed. Now, watch what I will do. I don't know how much you are good with Excel, but just watch me. Watch me. You will understand. I will say data. What if analysis? Go seek. If I do that, I'm going to copy this and paste session. I come here and I say data. Go, what if analysis goes seek? Set this cell. This last one. E40 to zero by changing what is here. Excel will do it for me. Can you see what has happened? Can you see what has happened? Please come again, please. I'm going to undo. Do you understand it all to this point? I copied what I had here and I put it here. But I now want to say, after changing the cash flows, this thing was no longer zero. Yes. But I know this thing, that at the end, you will not owe the lesser. Let's see also will not be owed. Am I right or wrong? So at the end, it will be zero. Am I right? Yes. Now, if I know that at the end it will be zero, the only thing that can change now is the opening, the closing balance. The closing balance. Wonderful. So what did I do? I put my cursor, I say, what if, go see, set this last cell, E40, to zero, by changing okay. the value that is in this closing balance. And I say, okay, Excel will do it. Okay. Now, what is the accounting entry? Please watch me. Accounting entry will now be the closing balance of the new one, 24. Minus the closing balance that we have. Three million. This three million. <coughs> this three million. Sorry. Thank you. Very much. This three million, what is the accounting entry you will pass? Debit credit. Right office. Wonderful. So you just come to the right of use asset. Right of use. And increase. So what has happened now is that the balance has increased, so I will increase it. And also come to the least liability. Least liability. And increase it. Any questions? That is the calculation and the, um, uh, and the accounting entries. However, this can only be done if the asset is still on the PPE. So let's now assume that the asset has been fully depreciated. I'm painting another scenario where that right of use asset, it has gone. We have fully depreciated it before we change this payment. What are we going to do? You see this amount. Rather than having debit to right of use asset that has finished, you will expense it. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. any questions? That is all. It's very straightforward. 
Any question, please? So it, it is it's the same thing that is on the slide, though. So if you look at this slide, you see a right of this asset. Adjustment arising from the remeasurement of the liability is added to the right of this asset. That's what I just show you. If the right of this asset is at the remeasurement, they add a zero balance. Any reduction in the liability will be recognized in profit or loss. Do you understand? I only just explain it to you in real life. Any questions? Have I answered the question on remeasurement now? Yes, sir. Wonder, so I can move on. So this is an example of what I just did. Question, sir. Fire. Yeah. Uh, like, let's use this uh, scenario that you you actually use now. This uh, this list time that has a five years term. Yes. Now, maybe during the competition, during the initial recognition, uh, when I'm doing the competition, instead of using five years extension period, mm -hmm. I use four years extension period, which is the mistakes for me at the beginning at the recognition. Now, how do I make that correction when I discover this uh, mistake? Uh, remember that that one is an adjustment engine, also. Okay. Because you were the one that made the mistake. That uh, you know what I'm, what I'm saying is that now, I have to, because instead of me using five years, I use yeah. four years. Yeah. So my right of use asset will not be, will be, there will be a difference between my right of use asset and also my lease liability because of my own competition. Yes. So, how so, like so you remember it. that when the day that you actually do did that right of use asset, PPE is what we'll be using. Okay. Remember that inside PPE, the standard requires that at the end of each accounting period, you go and review the exactly. useful life. Exactly. And so if you discovered you could have adjusted that from PPE and you know, because it has no impact again on the list that we have I don't know have I answered your question. Uh, not where well. I'm not too quite okay. clear that because means, when if I just only the right of use, then it means I should also adjust my list a bit. That's what that's my own thinking. Okay, so let us take this example. So let us assume that you have a list liability of 10, and the 10, let us assume there's no other payment that you made at the beginning, and you have a right of use asset. That right of use asset. It does not mean that your depreciation useful life must be exactly your uh, lease liability, lease uh, term. term. If you can remember, I said your lease term is, if it were that you are going to extend, it is going to be your useful life that has nothing to do with your lease, um, uh, lease term. But in a situation when you are not extending anything, it will be the lower of lease term and the useful life. So if it were that you are extending and the first payment that you paid was for two years, eh, your useful life would have been five years. But the money you paid, your lease that you paid was for two years. So inside the PPRE, you will still have a figure that is being depreciated, not as a function of the lease term at all. So if there's a a difference when you did your reassessment. It is the amount of the figure, it is the figure that is being added. That list term or that term of that you're using to depreciate, it is it has nothing to do with that list again. I don't know whether I've answered your question. If I've answered. Can you explain? Uh, hello, sir. Yes. Sir, yes. Let, let's look at it in this way. Okay. Because the question that my uh, my colleague asked is a very serious one. It can happen in the reality of commercial life. Now, let's look at it in this way. You said one thing earlier on that adjustment entry. Now, he said that if a list is supposed to be five years, but erroneously, it was initially recorded for four years. And then in the course of the treatment, it now occurred that, oh, this thing's supposed to be five years. Is it not that just that adjustment entry you made mention, 
you know, at every uh, close of account, I think there is a uh, IS that also stipulated that that give room for entry after adjustment. Can we use that standard to correct that uh, effect? Okay, IS8. So basically, for IS8, now, that particular error that you just talked about, let us assume that the lease started two years ago. Have it? Yes, sir. And it's for four years. So that means that yes. in year one, lease liability has either been understated and overstated. In year two, lease liability has either been overstated or understated. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So what many accountants will do is that you see all of the difference that should have entered into year one, year two, they will just pass everything to year three. Okay. So that the balance will now have exactly the correct balance. Okay, passing okay. a single entry. Yes. Yeah. However, okay. the impact uh, that, that's what I but want to do. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. But hold okay. on, that thing is not correct. No, no, no. Okay. That's why I said some accountants will mark my words very good. And that is okay. the fastest way to do it. But what okay. that will do really, really is that the amount of the interest expense that mm. should have entered that year three will now be overstated. Yes. Because what you should have used in year one and year two, you have passed everything into year three. Yes. Now, that way of doing it, it will balance. Your auditors have no go no. But the sincere <laughs> truth is that what you were supposed to do is that you were supposed to go and adjust it from the opening balance against the payment. But the problem with that is that you could have already, you have filed your account already. If you have filed your account again already, you it doesn't make sense that you go and take it back and refile. Because yes, sir. That's why I made mention of that uh, account uh, entry according to the standard. I just went after. Uh, uh, that's what I'm saying, that you can actually do that. But many accountants will just pass it and just regularize it. Of the balance of the new uh, So far, it's going to understate profit. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I, I, I have just explained to you the real thing to do, but there's also a fast way to move on. Eh? But that okay. fast way I've not told you is the correct, the correct way is that you would adjust it from the opening balance. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Should I open balance of Hello? the opening balance of the current period? Wonderful. Yeah. So it will eat with ten minutes. Exactly, yeah. Uh, that's uh, prior, okay, with ten minutes. Okay. Wonderful, you are very correct. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, so if no other question, no need to do this question, we have done it already. Um, presentation wise, for this in the book of the lessee, remember, you have in the statement of, I've explained this already, sir. In the statement of financial position, you have the right of use assets, you have this liability. In PNL, you have interest expense and in, um, depreciation charge for the right of use assets. We have explained all of this already, so uh, yes. uh, I don't need to do this case study, you understand already. Now, the lessor, what is the accounting from the lessor's perspective? From the lessor's perspective, that is where you can now say I'm doing either a finance list or an operating list. From the lessee is one. From the lessor, you can say I have a finance list or an operating list. It's a finance list if you are transferring substantially all the risk and rewards on ownership. If, and how do you know that? For example, if you are going to transfer ownership at the end of the lease, for example, if there is a first option to purchase, for example, the lease term is almost equal to the economic life of the asset. For example, the asset is only you that can use it. For example, they made a computer for you and they are leasing it to you. And you are the only company that can use that thing. Already, even if they don't tell you the name is finance list, it's finance list. Yeah? So if some of these things are there that show that substantially the risk and reward of ownership have been transferred to you. It is finance lease from the lessor's perspective. If this is not the case, then it is an operating lease, meaning that 
risk and reward on ownership has not been transferred to the lessee. That one, it was in the former standard. In the book of the lessor, we will recognize what we call net investment. See, net investment is just the other side, which is the lease liability. Do you understand what I just said? Yes, sir. Net investment is just the lease liability plus any indirect cost that you are incurring now. Meaning is the PV of all of the lease payment that you will collect in the future. So, you said? Okay. So, net investment is the money you are collecting today plus PV of all of the lease rentals you will collect in the future plus any cost you are incurring today that you are collecting from them. That is net investment. So, it's the flip side of what we just did. And when you have a net investment, what is the accounting entry? So, let me just do the accounting entry. Somebody has a question. Um, sir, is to okay. Okay, I think they are saying that the training is supposed to be two hours. They said I have overdone my number of hours. Is that true or false, sir? I think we are forgotten the time for this training, Amma. It's not up to, it's 11 to, uh, to 1, which is 2 hours. Okay, the time is 11 to 1 in 2 hours, so we have no overdone. I think we'll be... Okay. Amma, it's 1.30 already, so you know. Uh, okay. You can Amma, go enjoy this thing, Amma. You can go ahead. We have forgotten the time. However, no problem. I didn't even look at the time, if not because you mentioned it. No, I got the message that somebody actually said that. But net investment, I am running up very soon. Net investment is actually just the flip side of what we have been doing before, which is PV of all the money at the lesser that you will collect. Loss, all of the money you are collecting now, that is the amount. What is the accounting entry? I want to actually just show that very briefly. The accounting entry is just very simple too. The accounting entry for net investment will be debit net investment, Say for example, net investment, let us assume it is the amount that is here, uh, 40, 42. What is the credit? Where is the credit going to? The credit is going to, remember, that as you are actually paying, as, as, they are pay, as you are having this receivable, because this thing is actually a receivable, some of this one here that you are actually having as a receivable, you are picking it from somewhere. For example, you paid, uh, you have it inside inventory. You have bought all of the cars. They are sitting inside inventory. So I need to go and credit inventory and take it out. Do you understand what I've said, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah. And if there's anyone that, for example, you are buying the car separately, it will be going to the bank where you will be taking the money. That's so every, every categories or every items uh, generate the net investments will be our corresponding credit uh, wonderful, entry. Wonderful, wonderful. Where you are bringing it from. You no, know, there are some companies, they would have bought all of the cars they want to lease. Mm. Uh, there are some companies they don't do that. Okay, so that is that. This is just an example. to uh, So for operating lease, however, operating lease is simpler. Operating lease, the owner of the car, the lessor, is still carrying it in his book. For finance lease that we just talked about, he is not carrying the asset again as a pp &E. It is only net investment, yes. So, this operating lease, the owner, lessor, is still carrying it as pp and &E, And he's still doing depreciation. And the income that he will now be earning on his rentals, all he just needs to do is to spread it on a straight line basis. No PP required. You are collecting two, two million, uh, two, two, ten, ten million per year. Just as you collect the money, go and say uh, debit, bank, credit, income, finish. And if somebody has paid for 10 years immediately now, all you just have to do is that, oh, I have over collected it before. So I will say that, you know what? I have done That's debit, cool. bank, credit, different income. Whenever the time has come, I take it from different income and I bring it to income. Do you understand? Yes. yes. So, cost of underlying asset to 
will be there. So finance income, subsequently after initial recognition, if it's a finance lease, the finance income, just the same way we have interest expense, the interest income is the flip side data. From, yeah, so impairment on, with the guidance of IFRS 9 is also going to have impact on all of the net investments. All the net investments, impairment using the guidance of IFRS 9 would have impact on them. On guaranteed residual uh, value is the value that the asset is going to be at the end that the lessor believe that you will give him money for. Now, that particular figure needs to be reassessed annually to ensure that it is okay. So, any questions? Presentation and disclosure in the book, and in the finance um, list, statement of financial position, net investment we show here. In the statement of P and L, you would have your finance income. Uh, statement of cash flow, payments, disclosures, and on. Um, in operating lease, you have PPRE. If you are doing operating lease, you will still carry the PPRE and you will still be doing uh, your normal depreciation and you have your lease income as they come. Any questions? Any questions whatsoever from the beginning? I want to believe with this little point of mind, we have been able to look at identifying what leases are to. Um. Please Hello, sir. Please fire. In case of, you know, uh, there is one thing that we also need to understand, which is under uh, risk exposure. Yes. For for example, in the in this course of of this uh, term lease agreement, if I venture, maybe within the year or before the expiry. Um, maybe there is what is called theft or uh, inferno or fire outbreak or call yeah. on the asset, which affects the uh, economic uh, useful life or the economic benefit to derive. How can we treat that in case? Okay, so a major thing, impairment is a very key one. Remember impairment of course, when the recoverable value of an asset is lower than the carry value. So if a risk event has occurred, what it will do is that it will have an impact on the recoverable value. So IES 38 already, uh, if, if you actually check the, um, check, um, if it's PPE, for example, impairment of non-financial assets, that one is already taken care of. Because that one, the standard requires that your, you need to actually assess for objective evidence of impairment at the end of each accounting period. And if there are triggers of impairment, you will write down the asset to the uh, higher or fair value less cost to sell and value in use. So if there has been a fire, it would have actually had an impact on the recovery value. Do you understand? Okay, yes. So impairment will take care of this. As well. Okay, okay, okay. That's the point. That okay, take care of that. Any questions? So thank you very much. Uh, we want to believe that you have learned something. And with all the questions that have been gotten, I think your next time has been a wonderful question. Any, um, any uh, what's it, last words from anybody? Anybody, any questions you have, any contribution? Any last words? Uh, well, for me, you, you didn't tell us your name, sir. I said, okay, I said it from the beginning. My name is Oluwa Shewa Kinyelo. Oh, we, we really thank you so much for, your, for the knowledge of understanding you have passed across to every one of us. So may God bless you, sir, in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. We are very grateful. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate you. Mr. Shewa, I'm very, very grateful from here. It's been a very insightful session. Wonderful. Wonderful. Hope you had fun. Yes, I did. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, I've gotten you. a better understanding don't, don't of Don't forget uh, the slide and then probably show me the recorded uh, aspect. Okay. So two things we'll do. We'll send you the slides and we'll also send you a link 
to this. So this thing was recorded. So we just put it on YouTube. Then you can just go back and go and go and watch it back. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank we really appreciate much. you. We appreciate you too. And we hope to see, we hope to see you again. Yes, well, <laughs> it's a it's a clinic. So whenever this whenever you get to this, it's actually done twice in a month. So we have another standard that we we'll look at before the end. Uh, sorry, in in uh, in August. So we have two okay. standards to look at in August. Okay. So please thank invite you. as many people as possible. Of after. course. Yeah. We will start the crusade from the now. Crusade. Okay, well, <laughs> thank well, you, sir. Fun. Thank you very thank much. You. Bye -bye. Please, sir, before you go, can you give us your number? Okay, so my, my number is zero. Okay, let me, should I type it? Let me type it as a what do you call it? as a message here. Okay. I think we all have pain. You can go ahead and call. okay zero eight zero. Six zero. Okay, let me just type here now. Okay. Zero eight zero six zero one two okay. six nine seven two. So. You can send a mail to. This is my. Hi, stop. So, I want to believe you've had fun. I've had fun. We had fun that we even exceeded the two hours. And we are almost running to three hours. And somebody was saying two hours are novice. <laughs> it is almost three hours. <laughs> okay, so actually, actually, I don't even look at time. No problem. I understand. If it was not something you were enjoying, you would have respected, you would have caught it. Okay, no thank problem. You, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Cheers.